Praise the Lord and greetings to everyone today. Welcome to Christian Life Broadcast, a ministry of Christian Life Center right here in beautiful and cold Palm Coast, Florida, 5200 Beltair Parkway. We are a Pentecostal church that believes in the power of God. And we're so excited to be in the kingdom of God. God did amazing things this past weekend on Sunday. Uh, my goodness, uh, evangelist Jake Foster was here from Arizona, and he preached some incredible thoughts from the Lord on Sunday morning, what the devil doesn't want you to know. And then Sunday night, <clears throat> it, was a, it was a total spirit takeover. Uh, the people of God just found that flow of the Holy Ghost that came upon us, and we followed it. And uh, it was one of those services that you just don't want to leave. One of those services where where uh, the power of God is so strong, you just want to stay as long as you can. And we're so thankful for that. And uh, we hope and believe that this broadcast is helping you in your Christian life. We do want to testify that the Christian life is absolutely the best life. There's no other life to live that's greater than the Christian life. It's not a life of bondage. It's not a life of uh, of of inhibition. It's not a life of cloistering in some seclusion. It's a life of power, purpose, and direction. And uh, I highly recommend it. So that's why we're doing this broadcast. But I want to talk today about something that is, is so cool to me in scripture. And that is the repeated pattern of God's plan of salvation. The repeated pattern of God's plan of salvation uh, it's it's unbelievable how the Bible literally spans thousands of years of history, and yet it's one message, it's one voice written by men, inspired by God. God used these men to write his word, and uh, Peter said that these holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And, and so God's message is time, time does not constrain God. Time does not change God. Time sort of changes us. As time goes on, we change, we develop, we come up with new ideas. We realize our mistakes of the past and hopefully. And, uh, but God, God doesn't exist in time. He's not bound by time. Time exists in God. And so it's the same voice speaking in Genesis as it is in Revelation, same voice in Deuteronomy as it is in the book of Acts. And so I want to I want to demonstrate this today. I want to go through some scriptures in the Old Testament and New Testament and show you how there is a repeated pattern that God uses to demonstrate his plan of salvation. If you were to if you were to find a single scripture that captures that embodies a crystal clear plan for salvation, which is salvation from sin, deliverance from sin, entrance into the church, entrance into the kingdom of God. It is found in the book of Acts chapter two and verse 38. So this is, this is the moment that Peter is preaching the first message uh, on the day of Pentecost, the day that the church is born, and this is the New Testament church and the power of God falls. And we'll get into that shortly, but the power of God falls. They're all filled with the Holy Ghost. And then the people ask Peter, what do we do to be saved? Peter said in Acts chapter two and verse 38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So there's three components here. Repentance, which is a turning away from sin. It's a turning around. It literally means to turn around. You're walking a particular direction and you turn around. Change of direction. And be baptized. Every one of you. So baptism is not optional. How? in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So there's three components, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name for the remission of sins, and receiving the gift 
of the Holy Ghost. And these three components are found clustered together again and again and again and again in the Old Testament. And so we're going to, let's, let's dive into that. I want to show you, if you go to Genesis chapter one, the very first thing God shows us is this pattern for Acts 2.38. In Genesis chapter one and verse one, it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And here we go. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So what do you have? You have three components here. You have something that is formless and void. Void means empty, pointless, vain. And so repentance literally is recognizing this about yourself, that without God we are empty, we're pointless, we're vain, So you have this this state of the earth without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. You have the spirit of God moving and then you have water. So these three components. And then of course, after that happened, God said, let there be light and there was light. All of a sudden now we're able to see after these three components, uh, these three components are working together, and and this this coincides with what Jesus talked about in John chapter three, uh, when he's explaining the new birth to Nicodemus, he goes into it. Uh, Nicodemus came to him and began to uh, give his credentials and his discussions, rabbinical discussions, uh, with his peers. No man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. We've decided that you're actually a teacher that's come from God. Will you have our um, uh, conditional approval as long as you keep doing what we want you to do? We believe you're from God. Jesus answered, this is John chapter three, verse three. Jesus answered and said unto him, verily, verily, or truly I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see. The lights don't turn on until the new birth experience occurs. And so you see this in Genesis one, you have, something that's empty, void. The spirit of God moves upon it. There's water. When those three components are combined, God says, let there be light. You can see. So you have this pattern all the way at the beginning of time that God is demonstrating to us for us to understand. um, This is how things are going to work to be in the kingdom. Another example of this is is Noah's Ark. You have Noah's Ark. Uh, the, the, the Bible says that sin had increased upon the earth to the extent that God repented or he changed his mind. He, he regretted that he had made man. So he's about to destroy everything and he calls Noah, tells him to build the ark. Noah found favor in the eyes of God. Noah has to build the ark. And, and then God shut him in Genesis 7, 16, and Genesis 7, 17, it says, and the flood, which is water, was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth. So you have Noah and his family, first of all, before this water came, they had to leave the world and enter the ark. So they left their current worldly environment And of course, the ark represents the church. They went into the church. This is repentance. This is turning about. This is a change of direction. They're leaving their old life, entering into a totally new environment because God told them to. What happens after that? Water. Water's everywhere. And then two chapters later, or I'm sorry, um, The waters prevailed on the earth, Genesis 7, 24. And in Genesis 8 and 1, it says, and God remembered Noah. Now, this is after the flood had occurred. This is after the rain was there. This is after they were in the ark for for, um, 
many, many, many months. And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. So you have Noah and his family leaving the world, repentance. You have the water that comes and and baptizes everything. And then you have the wind blowing afterwards. So again, you have repentance, water, spirit. Repentance, water, and spirit. Now, Peter obviously saw this, this pattern and he talks about it in 1 Peter chapter 3. And he talks about Noah um, preaching 319, 1 Peter 320 talks about the people were sometime disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is eight souls were saved by water. Now that's interesting because it doesn't say they were saved from the water. It says they were saved by the water. The water was not the threat to them. What the water was destroying was the threat to them. The water was covering the sin. The water was washing away the sin in the earth and the sinful people, literally, from the earth. They weren't saved from the water. They were saved by the water. The entire earth was baptized again. And Peter said, let me tell you what this pattern's like. It's the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. So God literally did that. There literally was a flood. There literally was an ark. There literally was a a family with Noah. All this stuff happened, but it didn't just happen for then. It happened for a pattern of what Jesus would perform in us today. There's repentance, leaving the world behind, entering into the ark. There's the baptism that must occur, and that baptism is not optional. It does save you because it's for the remission of sins, for the putting away of sins. That water put away all the sins that were on the earth in Noah's day, and then comes the wind. The wind's going to come, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's so cool. It just goes on and on and on with this. I want you to look at Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abram. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country, that's repentance. Leave your world behind from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. I want you to come out from where you are and come to where I'm telling you to go. That's just plain old repentance. You know, there's a lot of people that want to come into church, but want to also keep their former lifestyle, their former way of thinking, their former friends, their former habits. That is not true repentance. True repentance is a turning away from what you used to be. It's a turning away from the lifestyle you used to live so that you can live the new lifestyle God wants you to live. And God God said to Abram, the first thing you have to do if you want to be in covenant with me If you want to be the father of many nations, if you want to be blessed, get out of your country. Leave your old world behind. Leave your kindred. That's tough. Now he's talking about his family. And leave your father's house. Leave the people closest to you. If if they're not going to come with you, you've got to take this journey with me. And we're going to go into a land that I will, will show you. So that's repentance turning away from the old, embracing the new. And then that wasn't the end of the story with Abraham. In Genesis 17, he begins to make a covenant with Abraham. And he said, in verse four, he said, as for me, this is Genesis 17, four, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. So he says, we're going to be in covenant, which is a contract with each other. It's a a testament. We're going to be in covenant with each other. And when you step into covenant with God, something happens. Your name changes. And this happened first with Abraham. I'm changing your name from Avram to Avraham. For a father of many nations 
have I made thee? And then he said, this is what it's going to look like in keeping this covenant. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 10. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. So we understand the repentance. We understand the turning away from the old world, leaving your old country, entering into a new land that I will show you. But then these things start happening. Number one, you have covenant, several key biblical words here, covenant, you have circumcision, you have name changing, and there is an instance in the New Testament that these things reflect. Where in the New Testament are these components all together? Covenant, circumcision, name change. Where does all that happen? It's a pattern for baptism in Jesus' name. Paul talks about this in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11. He says, in whom also ye are circumcised. There's that word with the circumcision made without hands. So in the Old Testament, they would circumcise a child, uh, a man child, a boy, eight days after they were born, and they would pronounce a new name over him. And that circumcision was actually a knife that would cut that little boy as a sign of the covenant. And he said, in whom also, talking about Jesus Christ, if you read back in verse eight, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. This is not a physical circumcision. Thank God you don't have to get cut when you come to the church. It's a spiritual, spiritual circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. There's a colon there because he's going to explain what the circumcision of Christ is. Buried with him in baptism. So in baptism... Your heart is circumcised just like Abraham's flesh was circumcised when he entered into covenant. When you get baptized, you enter into covenant with Jesus Christ and you receive the name of Jesus Christ. Go back, going back to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. You take on the name of of Jesus Christ. Your name changes. I'm no longer Joe Campatella. I'm Joe Campatella Jesus. I have received his name in baptism. And so again, everything that happened to Abraham, God used that as a pattern for the New Testament church to understand. So I want to go back there and look at that. So where's the spirit, right? We're missing the spirit. We've got repentance. Abraham came out of the world. Abram at that point came out of Ur of Chaldees, entered into God's land. We have circumcision, which represents New Testament baptism. And then watch this. In Genesis 17 and 5, neither shall thy name anymore be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. So this the Hebrew letter that was inserted into Abram's name is He. That's the Hebrew letter. If you, if you look at this, the Hebrew, and I, I seriously doubt I'm pronouncing this like a, a Hebrew, but I'm going to do my best. It's Avram. Avram. And then Abraham is Avraham. So what did God put in the middle of Abram? He put his he put his breath. He breathed into Abram his breath. And Abraham, Abram became Abraham. There's something in the middle of Abram that didn't exist before. And it's the breath of God. And you see this again, right? In Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I want to show you. I want to show you what that is. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. I love Esword. I use it all the time. I want, to, I want you to see spirit. There's a lot of stuff on it, but I want you to see the, 
the definition from Brown, Dri- uh, Brown Driver Briggs lexicon. Ruach, it means wind, breath, mind, spirit. The first definition is wind and breath. So when God is, when the spirit of God is moving, he, the, the pattern he wants to give us is that it's breath. This is why in Acts chapter, I'm sorry, John chapter 20, the Bible says that Jesus said to his disciples, receive the Holy Ghost. And he did what? He breathed on them. So in Genesis chapter 17, when God changed the name from Abram to Avraham, he was literally breathing his breath, his spirit into this man as a pattern for what would happen when we receive the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. I mean, that is, this happened, this happened 4,000 years ago. And this pattern is still happening today. Isn't God amazing? Oh my Lord, this stuff fries my brain. Let's look again. Exodus chapter 12, when God brought Israel out of Egypt, Exodus 12 and 51, and it came to pass, I don't know if you can see this, it's all the way at the bottom of the screen, but and it came to pass the self same day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their army. So what is Egypt? Egypt represents the world, right? Again, you have Noah leaving the world, entering the ark. Abram leaving the Ur of Chaldees, entering into the promised land. Israel leaving Egypt, which represents the world, entering back into the promised land. This is Repentance turning away from the old, embracing the new, turning away from your life, embracing God's life, recognizing that you're nothing, you're void, you're empty without God. Repentance is an act of humility before a sovereign God. I I need you. I don't want my old life. I don't want to live how I used to live. I want what you have for me. And that's what's happening. God is using, literally using the physical nation of Israel to represent this pattern. He brought them out of Egypt and they entered into the promised land. Now, that wasn't it, right? You can't just repent. There's more involved than just repentance. Exodus 14 and 21. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind. There's you got your water and your wind again. All that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. So you have repentance, water, and spirit. Repentance, water, and spirit. Repentance, water, and spirit. I think God's trying to tell us something. Repentance, water, and spirit. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. What are they doing? They're having to go through the water. You must be baptized, right? Paul said that they were baptized unto Moses in the sea and in the cloud, and, and so here they're being, it's a symbolism of being baptized. They're actually going into and through this water. And then what's so cool about this is Exodus chapter 14 and verse 23, and the Egyptians pursued. When you really repent and go through baptism, that old world's gonna try to overtake you. It's gonna come back for you. Those old temptations, those old habits, those old addictions, they're all gonna come back for you. But what happens when you go through the water and the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea and all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. They came after Israel. They didn't wanna let them go. That devil, that addiction doesn't wanna let you go. But watch what God does through the waters of baptism. Exodus 14, 27, and Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared and the Egyptians fled against it and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters return, covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. Everything that the enemy tried to use to pull Israel back into slavery. God destroyed it through the waters of baptism. Your past cannot follow you out of the water. It can't follow you unless you let it, unless you open the door for it. God shuts the door for it. And so that that pattern is repeated again and again. Repentance, leaving Egypt, going into the promised land, water and spirit water and wind. 
Check this one out. This is Judges. This is Gideon. Gideon was an unlikely champion for Israel. He was sort of a, a coward. He doesn't compare to any of the mighty men in Scripture, especially David's mighty men, where it's one guy against, you know, a thousand. Eliab and Shama and all these guys, Tobiah, plucking the spear out of the, out of the hand, uh, fight, fighting the, the, the lion-like man of Moab and, and killing a lion in a snowy pit. Shama is one of my favorites. He's defending the bean patch from a troop of Philistines, and he beats everybody. He ain't moving an inch. Where was Gideon? Gideon was hiding behind the wine press. He's, he's like looking for everybody hiding. And, and God, and you can read all this, God appeared unto him and said, hey, Gideon, mighty man of valor. Gideon's like, you're talking to me right now, um, which is wonderful because God always sees more in you than you see in yourself. God sees your untapped potential. So he called Gideon what Gideon wasn't at that time, but what Gideon would become if he followed God, which is just wonderful to me. So, so he, he says, you're going to get a great army. See who wants to come. And, and a bunch of people came, a bunch of people came. Then Genesis 7 and 3, the pattern begins to unfold. Now, therefore, go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. So you have this army with you that has left the world. They're coming and joining in the plan of God. But I want you to give the option for people who want to go back to the old life. And the Bible says, there returned of the people two and 20, 20 and 2,000. 22,000 people were there. So Gideon had an army of 32,000. 10 remained, 22,000 went back. So who is really sold out to this thing? That's repentance. You, you've turned away and you're not going back. Gideon had 10,000 that repented, that left the old world and came and followed the will of God. But repentance is not the only component, right? There's water. And the Lord, this is Judges 7 and 4, and the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water. I feel like we need an organ right now. My God. Bring them down unto the water. Uh-huh. Do, 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 do. They had to go to the water after they repented, after they decided were sold out to God's plan. And I will try them for thee there. And it shall, so you have repentance and water. It shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So now there's, there's, there's these three or two components so far that is like a filter God's using to see who really wants this. The first one is, are you really turning away from the world and sticking with the plan of God? 22,000, two thirds left, one third stayed. Then he said, okay, here's another filter. Bring them down to the water. This is the second test. And then I want you to watch what happened. Genesis, or, or Judges 7 and 5. So he brought down the people unto the water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. So you got the guys that are normal, that are just going to, you know, bow down on, they're going to get on their knees, they're going to bend over, they're going to scoop up uh, the water and they're going to drink or they're going to put their lips to the water, they're going to drink. And then you got these sort of, I would say, weirdos that are down at the water and something funky is happening with their tongue. They're all lapping up the water with their tongue. Their tongue's flapping. After they went down to the water, God says, I want you to notice whose tongue's flapping with the water. And verse six, and the number that of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth were 300 men and everybody else was normal. So 9,700 of them were normal. 
300 of them are doing something really weird with their tongue. What does that represent? After they went to the water. Let's go back to Acts 2.38. Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, that's water, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So it's not just the water. You're going to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What happens when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost? Well, let's see the first time people receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, and the pattern, again, is, is here. When the, this is all happening on the same day as Acts 2.38. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. There's the Spirit, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues. Now we got something. Tongues are being mentioned, like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. This is important because we're going to go back to Gideon. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. So when Peter said in Acts 2.38, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, this is his template. This just happened to them a few minutes ago in an upper room. And everybody that got the Holy Ghost, something really weird started happening with their tongue. They started speaking in languages they never spoke before. And God is defeating the Midianites thousands of years ago using this same pattern. Who's sold out? Who's really repented? Let them come. 10,000. Get down to the water. The water's going to divide between the 9,700 and the 300, and the 300 are going to be distinguished. Why? Because something funky is going to be happening with their tongue. They're going to be flapping that tongue. This is the pattern that is being played out in reality in the New Testament. And to this day, this is exactly how I was saved. I repented. Of course, believing in God, faith is the foundation of all this. You're not going to repent unless you have faith. You're not going to be baptized unless you have faith. You're certainly not going to receive the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues unless you have faith. So we're saved by faith. Faith is the channel through which uh, it all happens. By grace through faith. So again, the pattern is is repeated here. I want, to, I want you to see this. So in the book of Acts chapter two, you had the, the tongues of fire. Uh, Jesus, Jesus told him, you're gonna be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. John, or John promised, you're gonna be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. I baptize you with water, but he shall baptize you with fire. It's fire, fire, fire. So after these 300 men are divided, separated out. I want you to see Judges chapter seven and verse 16. And he divided the 300 men into three companies and he put a trumpet into every man's hand with empty pictures and lamps within the pictures. So you have, you have vessels that have fire in them. So the 300 that had something funky going on with their tongue, they now have vessels filled with fire. I mean, this is just too good to be true. And then, of course, when they, when they be, uh, started the battle, the trumpet sounded, um, and they broke open the pictures, and the fire got out. So this is, just, this is just absolutely wonderful. And so you have this, this constant pattern. I want to show you several places of people receiving the Holy Ghost and their tongues were used as the sign. So obviously we saw it in Acts chapter two and verse four. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them the utterance. Look at Acts chapter 10. Again, you have the same pattern playing out. Acts 10, 44, Peter's preaching to Gentiles. It's Cornelius, which is a Roman centurion. He's got his whole house together. And, and while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. The wind started blowing, right? And they of the circumcision which believe, which means Jews, were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. They heard something funky happening with their tongue. And they already knew that when that happens, God is singling these people out from everybody else. They're speaking in tongues. 
You have the third component. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. The Greek says the Lord Jesus. Of course, we know who the Lord is. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Again and again and again. Acts 19. Paul goes through the exact same pattern. And it came to pass that while as Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. He said unto them, unto what then were you baptized? They said unto him, unto John's baptism. So he's talking about water. First he talked about the wind. Now he's talking about the water. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul laid his hands upon them. The Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So what's the point of all this? The point of all this is that there's not different flavors to Christianity. The point of all this is there's no different denominations to Christianity. It is a lie from the enemy that there are different denominations. There are no different denominations in scripture. There's only one church in the Old Testament church and the New Testament church, it's all the same church. It's all the same kingdom. And, and the culture of today tells us, look, you can believe in Jesus your way. I can believe in Jesus my way. We're all going to go to heaven. We'll all talk about it and laugh about it when we get there. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. We'll all laugh about it when we get there. And you know, you, you Pentecostals were crazy, had all kinds of stuff going on with your tongues. We don't talk in tongues over here, but we still love Jesus. Where are you in scripture? Where do you exist in scripture? Because when you see people filled with the Holy Ghost, when you see the moment it happened, as it always happened, they're talking in tongues. There's always water involved. There's denominations that say you don't have to be baptized. Just believe. You don't even have to repent. Once saved, always saved. You can, you know, you can just say, I believe in Jesus and go drink your alcohol and smoke your cigarettes and uh, look at your pornography and lie. And, but God's grace is good and we're all going to go to heaven and he understands I'm weak and I'm sinful flesh. And man, where is that in scripture? I don't see that anywhere in scripture. Instead, what I see in scripture is the same pattern repeated for thousands and thousands of years. I see Jesus saying, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit. I see Peter saying, you got to repent and be baptized and you're going to get filled with the Holy Ghost. And then every time it was recorded, somebody got filled with the Holy Ghost, they were talking in tongues. Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19. There's no denominations. There's only the Bible. There's only one way. If you want to, get really into the, the nitty gritty of speaking in tongues. We did a, a, um, an episode on that specifically, one of the earlier episodes about what makes us different. And um, we can put a, we'll put a, um, a video right here. You can click on it and get all the information on, that's the first time I've done that in this podcast. I'm quite proud. They're going to put a video right here. But you'll get all the details on that, all the scriptures on that. But there's no denominations. There's no my view, your view. There's only God's view. That's what repentance is. It's coming out of your tradition. It's coming out of what you've been taught, Abram. It's coming out of the Ur of the Chaldees. It's You can't have your old ways. God, God told them, I want you to see this in these, uh, in these patterns that God gave us. Hebrews 8 and 5. All this, old stuff, all this Old Testament stuff, and especially the tabernacle, it was physical representations of a spiritual reality. And God told Moses, eight, Hebrews 8 and 5, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. He's talking about the priests and what they were offering and the gifts and the tabernacle furniture. These physical things serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, watch, 
that thou make all things according to the pattern. You don't get to choose about this. You don't get your, your opinion. I'm sure it's nice. I'm sure your, your tradition is nice. I'm sure um, there's been some really good scholars involved with your tradition. But the pattern we have to follow is not the pattern of Martin Luther. The pattern we have to follow is not the pattern of, of John Knox and John Calvin. The pattern we have to follow is the pattern of Jesus Christ and the Apostle Peter who laid the foundation, the Apostle Paul, who laid the foundations, Matthew, who laid the foundation, these apostles. If you're getting your information from a church father to clarify Scripture, Scripture clarifies itself. Scripture clarifies itself. There's no way around the pattern. There's no other way Jesus said, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, you cannot see nor can you enter the kingdom of God. I want to give you another scripture. Paul summed up this pattern in what Jesus referred to as the gospel. It's the good news. The good news is a, is a, is a message being preached about Jesus Christ Christ and the new birth and the entrance into the kingdom. Paul summed it up by simply relaying this pattern. Watch. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, also which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you unless you believed in vain. So you can believe and believe in vain. You can be saved, but lose it if you don't keep it in memory. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So the final pattern, the final physical pattern that God used was literally when God was in flesh, he lived the actual pattern. It was the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now there's more to the gospel, but that is the foundation. That is the fundamental entrance into the kingdom, the pattern for the entrance into the kingdom, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Paul linked the two together when he talked about baptism, he's, and we read this already, but it's, I want to reiterate with a different focus, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened or made alive together with him. So the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the pattern that we all follow when we repent, when we're baptized in Jesus' name, that's the burial. Repentance is the death. Baptism is the burial. And the infilling of the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues is the resurrection It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That resurrection comes inside of you, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. So I hope this was enjoyable for you. It's definitely our prayer with fasting that God would touch you through these broadcasts and that you see this pattern, that it's not just some random way into the kingdom of God. This has been happening for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. There's always something empty. There's always something being turned around. There's always somebody leaving the old, entering the new repentance. There's always water again and again and again. Genesis 1 and 2, Noah's Ark, the Red Sea, Gideon's River, Acts 2.38, there's always water. There's always a wind blowing. Genesis 1 and 2, uh, Abraham, God inserting his breath into his name. There's always a wind blowing when 
when Noah's flood, the waters were pushed back. What happened when the waters were pushed back? The earth got a second chance. It was the new birth of the earth. That's what happens when you're baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. It just happens again and again. When Israel came out of Egypt, the wind was blowing across that Red Sea. It just happens again and again. And so this is a repeated pattern. There's not multiple entry points. There's not, there's not multiple ways of thinking about it. There's, that is a trick of the enemy. There's one pattern, and it's summed up in the glorious verse, Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And let me tell you something, when you obey that pattern, you know you've obeyed it. Everything changes, everything's different. Everything's different. When I got the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues, everything changed in my life. God set me free and it's available to you. And this is what we preach at Christian Life Center here in Palm Coast. We do not preach according to the denominations of men. We preach according to the pattern and the power of the inspired word of God. And it's available for you. You will have to leave Ur of the Chaldees, Abram. You're going to have to leave your, your traditions. You're going to have to. Some, some people have, and I'm not saying you're, you're, you're doing it intentionally. Okay, family, we're done with you. You know, that's, that is not the goal but if your family fights you from entering this pattern, you're going, to have to, you're going to have to just pray for them and do it anyway. And hopefully you can convert them and still eat, have Christmas with them. But, but you're going to have to leave it all behind, Abram, and walk into the land I'm showing you. And that's the message that God gives to us. Let go of your tradition. Let go of your past. Enter into my promise. And when you do, you'll never regret it. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching. Thank you for all those that are subscribing. We're enjoying this so much and we're getting so many um, comments and positive feedbacks on all the platforms that this is going on. At whatever time you're watching this, um, I hope it was a blessing to you. Please like and subscribe. And uh, we have um, several comments coming in now for ideas on future episodes and we're working on those. And so thank you for that. The Lord bless you. In Jesus' name.